Hello everyone, this is criminal profiler Pat Brown and today we're going to go back in time to look at the Adam Walsh case, well, probably the most famous case in the United States of an, a missing child since the Charles Lindbergh case. So let's go for it. Let me say hello to everybody who's here. Um, this is a live chat, but it is for pa patrons only that have um, come on to Patreon and are supporting the channel. And if you'd like to join to the live part of the show, go below, click on Patreon, please join. And it supports the channel, which desperately needs it, considering the demonetization. And you can also participate in the live portion of the show. Um, but of course, the show is open to everyone, so never will you be not able to see the show. So um, the sh all my shows are open to everyone. Uh, and if you would like to support the show, but you don't want to join Patreon? Hey, just uh, like like the show, subscribe. That does help the algorithm. Or you can buy one of my books, like that one. Okay, that's that. Now let me say hello to everybody. Um, <laughs> we have a great crowd here today. Carrie's here. Lisa's here. Lisa S. and Lisa N. Uh, one is U.S. One is. Come on, Lisa. <laughs> I'm just blanking, Lisa. Australia, New Zealand. Why am I blanking today? Hmm. Um, <laughs> Gretchen's here. Hi, Gretchen. And Annie's here. And let's see, lots of Joe is here um, out of uh, the UK. And Benny's here out of Denmark. And let's see, K Rob's here. And I think if I missed you, I'm really sorry. I think I've got everybody here that are here so far. So, anyway, um, we have folks here from the US who know this case probably pretty well. And we've got folks from outside of the US who may not really be that familiar. And um, oftentimes we forget that if we're not from the country, that that isn't something we're even familiar with. So when I do shows uh, with Australian cases or New Zealand cases or cases from India, then the US people go, huh? I don't know anything about those, <laughs> those, those cases, but the people in those countries are super familiar with them. So this is a US case that some people are not familiar with. Um, let me try to explain the case to you. The, I'll just do the very basic, basics of this case. Uh, and then I'm going to show you that <laughs> this case has so many problems in who done did it that we have these two authors. And I have the books here. There's one book and here's the, here's the other book. I've got both of these books. I've read both of these books and I've had discussions with both of the authors of the books. Um, and each one of them thinks a different guy committed the uh, abduction and murder of, of little Adam Walsh. Um, but the problem is, this case is fraught with inconsistencies, a lot of guesswork, um, and quite frankly, it, it isn't as clear as people think it is, that he thinks it is, or that he thinks it is or that the supporters of either side think it is. So I'm going to get into this now. Um, let me let me tell you a little bit about these, about Adam Walsh. Uh, Carrie says this, uh, Lisa, I think you'll find Adam Walsh case fascinating. Yes, I think you will. This is, it is, it is one of the saddest cases and, and it really changed a lot of the way we deal with um, uh, missing children. Oh, and Florence is here. Hi, Florence. Uh, the way we deal with missing children in the United States uh, because of what happened to Adam Walsh. So let me ex let me give you the quick lowdown on this. This is Adam Walsh. He was an American boy and he was, let me see, uh, he was seven years old at the time he went missing. He was an American boy who was abducted from a Sears department store at the Hollywood Mall in Hollywood, Florida on July 27th, 1981. So we're talking 30 years ago. His severed head, and I think this is what probably propelled this case into everybody's brain and it never left. His severed head was found two weeks later in a drainage canal alongside Highway 60 in, in rural Indian River County, Florida. His death garnered national interest and was made into a 1983 television film, Adam. And it's in, this is really interesting because I saw that film, the 1983 film, and I can't remember if I saw it in 1983 or I saw it later on because I was not a profiler in 1983. Uh, I went into profiling in the 90s. Um, so I don't know if I saw it then because I was interested in what happened with you know cases or if I saw it earlier. But I'm going to tell you about one scene in that movie 
which is still in my head. It's stuck in my head all of these years, and I can still see it. Um, a huge impact on me. Um, the television film was seen by 38 million people since it's in its, in its original airing. His father, John Walsh, became an advocate for victims of violent crimes and was the host of the television program America's Most Wanted and, um, and later pursuit with John Walsh. And uh, his, Adam's father really ended up doing a lot of really great things for children, um, uh, just, just changing the whole way we look at these cases and how we publicize these cases, how we look for tips on these cases. So uh, a good thing came out of a really tragic thing, and I have to give John Walsh credit for that because, you know, it, it was a horrific, horrific crime, um, and it was his first child, and and at that point, I believe it was his only child. So it was just, you know, absolutely heartbreaking. And he was never a suspect. Like, you know, many cases, you know, we have where we go, oh, yeah, the parents did it, you know. Um, we knew the parents didn't do it in this case. And so they were sympathetic from the beginning and also acted like people, acted like true parents of a missing child. Uh, never had any question about their behaviors or their emotions, anything they did. So... That's kind of an interesting thing. So when you're looking at cases where we do believe that the parents were involved and you compare their behaviors to the Walsh's behaviors, that'll give you some indication about, you know, the actual difference between possibly guilty parents or very guilty parents and people who are not guilty of anything. So that's it's a good learning opportunity. So if you want to do that, look at the look at different uh, like um uh, television shows with interviews or any you know, any outreach the parents did to the public and see how these the guiltyish parents acted as opposed to the absolutely not guilty parents. So I think that's kind of interesting. Okay, so this case uh, after Adam went missing. Um, well, let me tell you about the parents first, just because I think this is really kind of important and a lot of times. Uh, I don't talk about the parents because I'm looking at the case itself, but I do want to talk about the parents here because, as I said, it really affected me um, and it really helped me understand what parents go through. And and, and this is um, this is John Walsh and Reeve Walsh. This is um, you can see in the even the their faces right here are so pained. This is right after um, they're trying to reach out to the public, right after the crime. And here they are. I think they were going off to New York to do a show. And it was kind of sad because you see how they got their little their suitcases and stuff. And they look just bedraggled and and just, just horrible, <laughs> quite frankly. So I want to read you from one of my books a scene that was shown in the movie, the scene that stuck in my head in the movie. Um, let me hold my second. I just want to. I want to point out, you know. Yes, <laughs> I shouldn't use a barf bag for that scene, but I have a barf bag here, and then I have these wonderful other bookmarks. You know, I, I, you know people say I'm not very professional, and maybe maybe I ought to get proper bookmarks <laughs> and, and not use things like paper towels. But hey, you know, what can I say? Paper towels, barf bags. Yeah, they were here and available. So I, I want to read the first thing that. Um, I'm going to hold on one second while I find it, because, you know, I always lose things. Um, the, dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it, where'd it go, where'd it go, okay, come on now, oh, I've lost it again, oh, here we go, um, this, this, this statement here, um, this is right after the crime, after, after Adam went missing from the mall, by the time John Walsh arrived at the mall, it was almost 3 p.m., I'm going, to, I'm going to explain about how he went missing from the mall when I describe the crime issues and the, and the investigative issues. So I'm going to go into that later. Um, and a cluster of Hollywood police cruisers were nosed up to the curb outside the garden entrance to the Sears store, their flashes whirling. He parked quickly and ran inside to find a distraught Reeve. I'm not sure how you pronounce her name now because I see a, a no. Hmm. Mrs. Walsh. <laughs> there, there's a, there's a, um, little accent mark about above the last D. So is her name Rive? I, I didn't actually hear this on a show recently, so oops. Mrs. Walsh, speaking intently with a policeman. When she turned, he saw the desperation in her face. 
as he put it, and I think this is just an amazing quote, for the first time in my life, I understood what real fear was. And that just, that kind of breaks my heart right there. Because I think that we don't actually know. We fear that fear. It's funny, we fear that fear. I mean, you know, when, when our child goes missing or our grandchild goes missing around the corner, we're in a store, we're in like aisle two and they run into aisle one. We're like, ah, you know, where are they? We, got, we get that little sharp feeling of, oh my God, you know. Um, but when he arrived, he knew what real fear was because his child was missing. And it just, that just, that statement. Okay, so now I'm going to go to what's in the movie. My barf bag part. Okay. Now I'm going to try to read this and not cry. Because, you know, a lot of you say that, you know, how do you do this job? Because, you know, uh, how do you look at all these crime scene photos and, you know, look at all these cases and not let it emotionally disturb you? And I'm really good with um, looking at, I'm looking, I can, I, can, I can analyze cases without a problem. I can eat pizza while I'm looking at crime scene photos. But once in a while, when I have to talk with somebody who that they themselves are expressing emotion, or I have to see what they're going through, that's the thing that always gets me. So, this got me in the movie, and they did a really good enactment of this, what happened here. Uh, and so that is actually a visual. I can still see it in my head, like running like a movie in my head. Year, 30 years later from when I actually saw the movie, or 20 years later, and there's very few of those kind of things that roll in my head. That's one of them. Let me try to read this to you. <clears throat> All right. This is the way he recalled it. And then the phone rang. This is now, now Adam has been missing for two weeks. They don't know what's happened to him. And now he's getting the phone call about when they found, because they had found his head in the canal. And the phone rang. Is this Mr. John Walsh? Yes, it is. Mr. Walsh, we are so very sorry to have to tell you this, but the remains that were found last night in Vero Beach have been positive, positively identified as Adams. I went down, right onto the floor. See, I can't get this. <laughs> it felt like somebody took a huge wooden stake and shoved it into the wall of my chest. I couldn't breathe. I thought I was having a heart attack. I felt like I was dying. Please let me trade places with him. Death would have hurt me so much less. I thrashed and I screamed. I yelled and pushed over the mattress and smashed things. I broke glass and a picture frame and tore off the sheets and threw lamps and kicked the table over. I was like a wounded animal, dying the way a wounded animal dies. I could not deal with it. It was unbearable, unbearable. I thought that my heart was going to explode. The little boy I had waited for all my life was dead. Okay. I told you I couldn't get through that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Control myself. Okay. In the movie, the scene that I remember that they showed was he was in, I think, a hotel room or something. I'm not sure if that's where he was. And there was a bed. And he kept running his head in between the mattresses, like like running into the mattresses. You see the mattress go up as he rammed his head into the mattresses between, you know, on the bed. It just... Uh, that to me is probably the most dramatic scene I've ever seen that showed the true feelings of a parent who's lost a child. And I say, I've seen a lot of cases and I've seen a lot of parents stand up there and say, you know, my missing child and so forth, especially the, the ones who made them go missing. And I've never felt that. And when I saw that movie and I read this thing, yeah, that's it. Okay, okay, excuse me a second. <laughs> so you see, I do have emotions. I'm not a total psychopath. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Uh, that gets me every time. I can't, I get uh. them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, innocent parents, <laughs> like I could say, truly, truly innocent parents, and went through the worst thing in the world. And uh, I have to appreciate, you know, that um, uh, John Walsh went on and did wonderful things for children everywhere you know and, and somebody asked me the other week because I've been on a show and they asked me what it was like to meet him and and I was kind of st 
stuck at that moment because I know I didn't, I, I, he was kind of distant and kind of like, you know, I didn't really end up with a good, you know, rapport with him. It could just be that he was in a rush. It could be that I was just somebody on a show and he's had so many somebody's he could care less. Um, it could be because he, he, you know, he's been in the television industry a long time. It could be because he's just had to deal with so much, you know. Who knows? So I, I don't think I have a very good, I, I can't say, you know, personally what you know my what I think about John Walsh I just think he suffered a horrendous hor uh, horrendous tragedy in his life and he went on to do some really great things so that's what I can say about that so anyway thank you Joe for <laughs> a big a big hug from the UK thank you okay <clears throat> okay oh that's very nice I'm, I'm, I'm empathetic well I do have moments you know and I say, because I work in this field, people often, and I make a lot of jokes on my shows, and I have a kind of, you know, black sense of humor, um, that people think, oh, my God, you know, she doesn't give a crap, uh, but I actually do. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I'm good. I'll talk over this in a minute. Uh, usually, usually I fall apart laughing on the show, and I can't get that back. No, no. Okay, that one always gets me, though. I swear to God, of all things out there, that is the one. And when I read it in the book, I, you know, I had read it many years ago, but when I read it again in the book, I'm like, oh, my God, that's that scene. Okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, all right, now, moving on to the issues in this case. And but I did promise, by the way, I promise you because it was Easter, I have an Easter surprise for you, okay? So if you hang in long enough, you're going to see the Easter surprise. It's not totally at the end of the show. It'll be just toward the end of the analysis. I have an Easter surprise for you, okay? And I think you're going to appreciate it. So um, hang in. Okay, so now, okay, let's get to this. All right, now, the first thing we, we have here is let's see what actually happened. So let's go to the day it happened. Because, because one of the problems in this case, there's a lot of blame and finger pointing, like he could have done a better job, the police could have done a better job, why didn't they do this, why did they focus over here? There's a lot of that going around now. Uh, because the case went unsolved for so long and is theoretically still unsolved, although they claim it's solved. Now, it's what you call administratively solved. In other words, the the Hollywood Police Department and 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 John uh, uh, John Walsh are like we're good with with the concept that Ot Otis Tool was the one who committed the crime. So um, so uh, but does that mean it's solved? It, and is it solved legitimately? And this is what I want to point out. And I want to show you where things get so convoluted. So this case is one of those. Now the first thing I want to point out is. When he, what happened to Adam at the store? This is the Sears store. I think that's actually a legit picture from that time. As the, the, the store is now gone. It's now something else. Uh, but this is a, this is where Sears was in this mall. This is the actual car that Mrs. Walsh, because I can't say her name now, Mrs. Walsh drove to the mall. And, and she actually left this car for a while, like days hoping that somehow her son would find the car and return to it. And she had a note in there like, stay here, we'll find you. And it's, it's really kind of sad, you know, but she, that was, you know, she left this car. Now, what happened was this. Um, there's no question that Mrs. Walsh and Adam went to the store. Okay, they did that. The question comes down to is when he disappeared from the store. This is really confusing. Um, here's why it's confusing. Now, I'm looking here at local10.com. This is from Florida News at the time, okay? It says, by 11 a.m., Mrs. Walsh packs Adam into the car she drives, a checker cab painted gray. They leave the house. Mrs. Walsh has to drop off a check for Adam's tuition at St. Mark's Lutheran School. It's 1.1 miles away from the house, a four-minute drive. That, so they're saying she left at 11. She arrived at the school at 11.04. Then it's off to Hollywood Mall, just five minutes away. So she would arrive at 11.09. Now check this out. R Mrs. Walsh arrives at the Hollywood Mall at approximately 12.30 p.m. What? <laughs> Wait. 
Didn't you say she left at 11? It took her nine minutes to get here. 11 on nine. No, how is she arriving at 1230? What in the world? This is reporting. Even back in the, you know, these days. My God, was that crap. So <laughs> that is a problem. It does point out here. She finds a parking space on the north side near Sears receiving dock. So that's where, where she parked. She parked there. I'm going to show you the inside of the store in a minute. Now, if I look at this this one, this is the, now this book, let me explain the difference between the book. This is the book that believes Otis Tool, Otis Tool, and some people say Otis Tool. I'm going to say Otis because nobody seems to, it seems to be different all the time. <laughs> um, I could call him Mr. Tool because I can't do, you know, I'm bad with first names, apparently. So anyway, this was written. It's called Bringing Adam Home. It's done by uh, Les Standiford is actually just a writer. And Joe Matthews is a guy that worked on this case. And I just want to point out, and I did meet Joe, and I did meet um, uh, John Walsh there. I don't have much memory. He did write this nice thing, and here it says, uh, To Pat, for truth, knowledge, and justice to the one who really knows. Oh, that was very nice of you, Joe Matthews. I appreciate that. Um, so anyway... I, I vaguely remember being at this book signing. I don't know. I don't remember where it was. I may have been in Florida at the time uh, doing a conference. Um, don't remember. Anyway, he is the one that believes that Otis Tool is guilty. Now, let's go to what happened there. Basically, he says in the beginning of this thing on July 27th, it's a Monday, and it says here that, sh that uh, it's a two. It says here that it's a two-mile drive to Sears Mall, and there's a bonus plot, bonus here that there's a parking space she liked to use near the receiving dock. There is not one mention of what time she actually went to the mall. None whatsoever. And it just says that, you know, while she was in there, she had left her son for a few minutes. Um, he had, um, what happened was when they were just inside the doors, let me show you the inside the doors. Um... So here is here's the inside of the of the place. Okay. So, so it, you can actually where the heck is my picture? Mm, dang it, I blocked. Oh, that is annoying as hell. Um, sorry. This picture had a picture. I'm trying to look at it now. You can't see the door. The door is right here. It's so annoying. I thought I had the door there. Oh well. Anyway, the door is right here. So they would have come in here, straight from the parking lot. And here, you see this like little Atari area. It's like, oh, cool, what a neat thing. Okay. Um, and you see a bunch of kids here in, in, in really bad shorts. So that must have really been a long time ago. <laughs> really long time ago. Uh, there's a bunch of kids playing right at this spot. So this is where she left Adam. Why did she leave Adam here? And it says that... Um, now, let me go back Go back here again. Uh, I just lost my spot. Oh, that figures. Okay. Hold on one second. Here we go. All right. Just inside the doors at the entrance to the toy department. Now, there's a, there's a, whole, there's a whole argument over here that this isn't really the toy department. Uh, he's, her son spotted a video display with a demo of the new Asteroids game playing. And if you're as old as me, you'd actually know what the Asteroids game is because I was like, Outside of Pong, it was like the first real uh, <laughs> real video game. And I actually did play that one. Um, and he begged his mother to let him play. She hesitated, but home furnishings was just a couple of aisles away. And so she was looking for a lamp, and it had been advertised. So she want, just was going to go down the way to the home furnishings aisle and look at that. She pointed out to her son where she was going and told him she'd be back in a few minutes to pick him up. She gave him a kiss and rushed off to see the lamps. She would relive the moment a hundred, perhaps a million times. Had she just said no to him, stay with me, and then she had simply returned to the game display a minute sooner, had any of a thousand things happened, then this might not have happened. So anyway, she went to look for the, the lamp and had some problems finding it. She, they, they searched. She got a salesperson. They searched up and down the bright aisles, could find none of the barrel lamps on display. The clerk was happy to check in the back, of course. It would only take a moment, which turned into something more. This is very important, the something more part. When the clerk finally returned, her downcast expression said it all. They hadn't gotten any of these in. So she said, okay. The mother gave, Mrs. Walsh, gave the, her name and number to her and hurried away to where her son was. She got there and her son was not there. Okay, so 
in this particular instance, we have no time of arrival. We have no, you know, how long was she missing from that area? How long was Adam Walsh on his own at this spot? Okay, now if we go over to the other book. Now let me explain the other book. This is uh, about Jeffrey Dahmer. The guy who wrote this is Arthur J. Harris, who I've had a number of conversations with. He truly believes that Arthur, uh, 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 Jeffrey Dahmer committed this crime and not Otis Toole. All right. He says here that, uh, let's see, where to go? Okay. I found this thing here. That, that the problem was there was no actual time listed. It says here in the police report uh, that doesn't even give a time in the police report. It says that she, he was last seen in the toy department. Uh, she said, it said that Mrs. Walsh, it calls, that's the reportee, returned to the toy department approximately 10 to 15 minutes after she left the per missing person. Okay. All right, here's the problem. I don't know. There, there's a claim that in the long run, what they say is that Mrs. Walsh left Adam there at 12.15, returning at 12.30. That's kind of the final determination by a bunch of people who have no, absolutely no clue that that's true. And, th and that really bothers me because I hate stuff when you say things are true when you, when literally you don't know if they're true. So uh, I don't know when she got there. I don't know what, how, what time she left him there. I don't know how long she was away. But I'm going to say after she searched all those aisles and then the, and then the, the salesperson had to go look it up and then come back and tell her it wasn't there and they have to order it and she went and gave all that information. 15 minutes may even be questionable. May have, maybe it was 30. Now, so we don't actually know when he went missing. And that's important simply because there's a lot of sightings. There's a lot of claims about what happened when Adam disappeared out of the store, um, whether he was... Now, there's also this story, and here again we have these questionable stories. There's a story that that four kids were like at the at at what at the Atari station. There were like two black kids and two white kids, and and they were becoming obnoxious. And so the 17 year old security guard, which later they say wasn't a security guard, one girl, teenage girl, came over and said, "Hey guys, cut it cut it out. You got to leave." And supposedly, according to some, she threw the kids out of the store. Other times they just say she just told them to disperse, go back to your parents. And the black kids went one way and the white kids went another and she didn't pay any attention. Later on she says that, yeah, maybe Adam was one of the kids. but it, And it, maybe, it was, maybe it was at that time, maybe it was at another time. <laughs> In other words, nobody actually knows whether Adam was forced out of the store, which is what some people believe. He was forced out of the store and therefore was standing on the sidewalk. But the problem is there's no actual evidence that that actually happened at all. So, but there is one, so there's two possibilities here. Let's look at the two possibilities because we're trying, we're, what we're trying to do here is, is profile and, and look at evidence. We don't know whether he was taken from the store or taken from outside. Now, he was inside the store, his mother was down the aisle. It's probably fairly unlikely that somebody would be able to come up to him and say, hey, let's leave. So it is more likely he left the store, went outside. So let's go look, let's, let's look at outside again. Okay, so here's outside. Um, he's outside the store, and I believe he probably was outside the store. I do believe that. All right. Now, there's a couple reasons why he might be outside the store. More than one. One is that, yes, they told the kids to get out of there, and he didn't know where else to go. They threw him. Maybe they did. Maybe they did. She told him, get out of the store. Who knows? She's a teenage girl. We don't know if it's even true that this Adam was part of the group. Uh, but, you know, or how much she's telling us the truth. Like, you know, she doesn't want to admit things. She doesn't want to admit things. Who knows? You know, so anyway... If, let's say, she threw the kids out of the store, then Adam would be standing on the sidewalk going, what do I do now? Because I have to wait here for my mother to come and get me. In theory, that would be true. Uh, and, then, and then Mrs. Walsh, by the time she goes to find him, doesn't see him there. He's already been taken from outside the store. The other possibility is, which I'm sure this is one of the things Mrs. Walsh probably suffered with for years, 
was that how long did it take her to get back to him? And if it took her too long, is it possible her that uh, Adam thought she was out? He should go out to the car, and he walked out to check on whether his mother had taken was at the car. You know, because because he's you know he's a he's a young child. He might say, hey, I should go check. And it's not a reason, unreasonable thing to think. I'll go look and see if she's at the car. He might have walked out into the parking lot on his own without being thrown out of the store. Um, so, and I'm sure that weighs on her mind. However, I do want to point out, as many people have pointed out, this was way, this is 30 years ago. I walked to town when I was eight years old. I walked all the way to town by myself. I went to walk to school all the time by myself. Um, it wasn't a big deal. We played outside until those lights came on and you were supposed to be home when the lights came on or I had we had dinner at 6.30. Be home at 6.30. Even when I was seven, six and seven, I ran around the neighborhood by myself. That was not unusual. So that these days, we'd probably never leave our child at that age unattended. You know, my granddaughter just turned eight. I would never leave her there by herself. I'm like, she's like glued to me. I'm paranoid. But, but that, those were, that was 30 years ago. So I can't blame anybody. I you know, so Mrs. Walsh decided, hey, watch, play the game, I'm going to go up there. She probably wasn't even the least bit worried until she got back and he wasn't there. So there's no blame to go here. No blame to go around to anybody, including if they, the kids did get thrown out of the store. Hey, kids came into the store by themselves. They walked to the stores by themselves in those days. They left by themselves. No, not a big deal. So that if the teenager said, get out of the store, still not a big deal. So Adam would go out and stand on the sidewalk. Big deal, you know. <sighs> But I do believe he was outside. So then we come to the next issue. What happened to Adam once he got outside the store? And now we've got different opinions on this. Because we got the two, the two books, right? All right. We have the problem of witnesses saying they saw things. Um, but the most interesting thing is what people said they saw first. Um, and that would be giving, giving this guy and Jeffrey Dahmer a, a, a bit of a head start. The claim is that some people saw a blue car um, coming outside. And, and there was original statement that somebody saw a blue vehicle, out, a blue van. Well, let me show you the vehicles now. These were the two vehicles in question. Let me show you the two creepy dudes first. <laughs> okay. Honest Tool. That is a creepy dude. And there's Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, I'm going to get into how they ended up, how or how they would have ended up in Florida at that point, because he was up, he was staying up in Jacksonville, Florida, which is way, way north, like hours north. He normally wasn't even anywhere near Florida, except he was at that particular point in time. So that's 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 unique. All right, so here are the two vehicles. Otis Tool supposedly had access to this vehicle. And, and Jeffrey Dahmer had supposedly had access to this vehicle. Okay, so right after the crime, there was there were not reports of this vehicle. There were reports of a blue van, and they looked for this blue van all over the place. Okay, now originally somebody, there's a bunch of different stories about the blue van, and one of them came later where a guy comes in later and says, after he saw Jeffrey Dahmer's picture, he said, oh my God, that's the guy. I saw him pulling this kid and throwing him into a blue van. But this was years later. Um, there was another person who saw the blue van around, some, a kid, and he thought he saw something weird about a blue van. But they never were quite sure whether that kid even had the right day because he was a little kid. So the reason that, even though they did look for the blue van, so I can't fault the Hollywood police um, and the Detective Hoffman who was on the case at the time. They looked for this blue van. They didn't find any particular blue van that, they could do anything with and they weren't sure that the kid's story was accurate okay then there was another story uh, a guy told about how a creepy dude said something to him like hello and then he followed him because he thought he was so creepy and i'm like <laughs> and he followed him to the toy department and then that was it i'm like wait a minute so i mean I'm a, i've been in a lot of malls i've seen a lot of creepy people i don't usually follow them I mean, unless they did something really weird. And why would you follow them to a toy department and go, oh, yeah, okay, so now he's found the kids. Bye. <laughs> I mean, that's a weird story, too. So what we have in this case from both, both authors is reports of witnesses who claim they saw a guy that looked like Jeffrey Dahmer 
We actually don't, we have some that maybe say an O'Toole looking guy. You know, so, I mean a tool looking guy, sorry, not O'Toole, tool, tool, honest tool looking guy. So we have these vague reports and none of them are proven. And so this is the problem. The police never had at that point in time any actual names or any actual vehicles. They just had a couple reports from a few people once they heard the news. And you know, when you're in the, you know, you're looking at a case, you put out the information, you're going to get tons of tips of people who claim they've seen things and they exaggerate things too. Like, let's say a guy got near you. Uh, one woman said that there was this other incident where this creepy guy got near her daughter and he, and so they thought he was trying to abduct her daughter. Was he? Or was it just some guy who walked by and brushed her and they thought, oh my God, he's taking my daughter. I don't know. That's what the police have to deal with. They're like, oh, here we go again. We got 1,000 reports of creepy dudes. And some of them are, are people who just think they saw something and actually think they saw something. Some of them actually saw something, but it's not even the right day or the right hour. Then there's the people who are psychics who say they saw something in their head. Um, <laughs> and then there are people who see a photo later on and think, oh, my God, that was the guy. And we don't know that that's the picture they really saw of the guy, you know, the actual guy, or whether now that they've seen this picture and he's called the serial killer, now you put the two together and you say, oh my God, see, that was the guy. So all of these witness things are all questionable. And so, yes, he looked forever for other witnesses and found them. So did he. So you get this, this, yeah, this, so this is what happens. Um, Lots of people saying things that you don't know are true. So here's the first point of this of, of this whole issue, that there were witnesses to people. Now, even even especially the one guy who said, "Oh my God, I saw a guy throwing the kid into this van." Um, there was nobody that said they saw um, Otis Tool putting a kid into this vehicle. That's there's no such thing. There's a there's like I saw a creepy dude that looked like Otis Tool. This one actually did have somebody say that they saw a guy throwing uh, a kid into the van. Okay. So he, they kind of like, oh, they're one point up over here. Okay. Now, I'll get to the vehicle issue in a minute. Um, so now, okay. <laughs> wait, wait, I got to go back here. G Joe says, an Easter surprise, you're not going to tell us who killed Jesus, are you? Hang in there, Joe. You never know. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Let's go on here. So now, the child has gone missing, and they find his head in a canal. All right. Now, what happens from here on out? We've got we've got two possible suspects. Now, there's now I'm not saying there's other not other possible suspects, but these are the only two they really got going. Oh, in the beginning, uh, there was another suspect, and there was a guy that lived with the with the Walshes, and he apparently had a like a one night fling with uh, Mrs. Walsh. Well. John was not around, and, and it was a kind of a, an embarrassing and, and horrifying thing at that moment in time to have to bring that up. But then the police honed in on um, the Hoffman, especially Detective Hoffman, honed, on, honed in on this guy who had the little fling with her and um, said, oh, he, he was the one who killed, who, he, he ki kidnapped Adam and killed him so he could be with Mrs. Walsh. I, okay, that was his idea. Now, let me, let me just straighten that up right now. There was no way that anybody, anybody, because some people said also that John Walsh was involved with some real estate deals which were involving the mob, and the mob may have been pissed off at him and, and kidnapped Adam and, and cut off his head as a, as a message. Okay, let me put it this way. When, when Mrs. Walsh went to the mall and left Adam for those few minutes, and he happened to be out, end, up, end up outside, no one could have predicted that. Not the not the living rumor who supposedly had little little fling or the mob. No one could have predicted that. It happened in such a short period of time. It was not announced. It wasn't like he was going to school every day at this time and he was kidnapped off the street outside the school. This was some completely unannounced Mrs. Walsh decided, I'm just gonna go to take care of these errands, and she chucked her son into the car, took him there, and all these happenstance things meant that whoever grabbed Adam was pure luck. They were there in the parking lot when Adam was outside. They saw him. They grabbed him. I will say 100% this is a serial killer. 
I have no question about that. This is not a mob hit. This is not a some like I'm going to get rid of the kids so I can be with a with a, with his, uh, the kid's mother. Um, this is all nonsense. It was just a lucky thing where the well unlucky that the boy comes out here and the guy comes driving by with a car. This is car in sign language. Uh, and oh my God, the guy says, "Hey, I see a kid," and takes him. Okay. The question is, who took him? And how did they take him? Yes, this is exactly this is exactly correct. Um, a cry. Sorry, my, my nose is itching. I, always, I do this show. My nose always itches. I think it's the lights. <laughs> um, um, a crime of opportunity. C absolutely a crime of opportunity. Correct. Not you know. And one has to understand that sometimes serial killers do circle and they 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 surveil a certain area because they see children coming and going from that area. So this could be a serial killer who spent a lot of time surveilling the area and finally. Dang, I got lucky. Here's a kid by himself, and he snatches him. This is not the case, supposedly, with either one of these. In both of these cases, uh, Tool and um, Dahmer, in both these cases, it's literally that they came there one time and got massively lucky on that one moment. And this is, this is, this is a little bit confusing. Can that happen? Yes, it can. Would it have happened? It's it's the probabilities are low. Could it have happened? Yes. Okay, so let's let's talk about how they got there. Oh my God! So hold on a second. <laughs> um. Okay. So now let's talk about who was there in Hollywood, Florida, at the time that Adam went missing. We actually know he did. He was actually closest to the area. He was actually working in Miami Beach, and then he worked for this pizza place and the sub shop, and he was sort of in the area. Um, actually living in the area. This is Dahmer. He was living in the area. Now, did he, he did not own a vehicle. Okay? He did not have a vehicle. Now, this blue van, what happened was... Uh, Arthur J. Harrison, sorry, Harris, sorry, sorry, Arthur. Um, Arthur J. Harris did a lot, a lot of um, investigation, and he found out that one of the shops he worked for had three vehicles, and one of them was a blue van. Then he did a lot of investigation, asking people, asking the people that worked there who had access to the blue van, and apparently. Someone could access the van who worked for the group, which um, which uh, Jeffrey Dahmer did, but he'd have to get the keys, and sometimes it was kind of, uh, let's say, not being paid attention to, so that he could have gotten hold of the keys and then used the van for nefarious purposes. So did Jeffrey Dahmer have an opportunity to use the van? The answer is possibly. However... There's two. There's it's a bunch of reasons why this is a little weird. First of all, he would have had to access the van without permission, and then he would have had to drive to Hollywood Mall. And oh my God, got lucky, and here was a kid, and then he snatched him, and threw him in the van, took him someplace, and where did he take him to? Because the head of of Adam was found. Now let me show you the the location. Um, and this is this is a really interesting part of the whole case too. Okay, this is oh shoot. Let me see here. Okay, okay. You can see Vero Beach up here. Way down here is I can't see because it's it's small to me. But Hollywood's way down here. So you have to drive all the way up here, and then you have to go on. This is 95 going north. This is this is the Hollywood Freeway. So anyway, the guy got off on the Hollywood Freeway, and about here there's a marker here that I'll talk about later. A marker. This is where his, that's Vero Beach, so it's close up here. Anyway, somewhere along here, somewhere along here, there's the marker. Um, might be about there. Uh, anyway, the kid was, the head was chucked into this canal, okay? So, the problem is, if he has borrowed a vehicle and kidnapped the child here, then he's got to do something with the kid. These got who I don't know what he wants to do with the kid because you know Jeffrey Dahmer kind of like to play, kind of like to have them around for a while, you know, and, and enjoy them. And then um, you know back and back when he was eventually this was this was way earlier than his his all of his hijinks up in um, 
uh, was it was it Wisconsin? And anyway, where he just picked up guys off the street and brought them home, and then and then sedated them, and then eventually killed them, and then had sex with them, and then boiled you know parts of their bodies and kept their heads. He had a lot of heads in his house. And but back in the day, and this is why he's a suspect because he liked to cut heads off. But he usually liked to keep the heads, not toss them away. So anyway, he had to get hold of Adam and then do something to him that he would enjoy. And, okay, let's say something went wrong and he didn't get to do that. But the head ends up way up here. And later. So he'd have to borrow the vehicle yet again, that blue van. He'd, he'd got to take the blue van again and then somehow get up here and dump for reasons. You know, why would he go so far to dump a head? You know, if he's living down here, why is he up here dumping a head? Uh, again, makes no sense. Then he's got to turn around and come all the way back. The, the vehicle's going to be missing for a long period of time. Might be very noticeable. Um, and then what about evidence in the vehicle, like blood and other things he might leave in the vehicle. He'd, would he have to stop and really wash the vehicle down? So the, the, the likelihood of him doing that, barring the van like twice and then taking the headway up here, and, is just hard to really work out. Um, uh, let's see, I want to point out here what uh, Benny has to say. Also, Adam does not fit the profile of Dahmer's victims. Uh, Jeffrey went for physically attractive males uh, like 14 years old and upward. This is also correct. He liked young men. He liked young men he could have a relationship with, uh, you know, a, a sexual relationship with and a personal relationship with, even though they were dead at the time. But, you know, <laughs> dead people don't complain. So, you know, you can have your... You know, maybe that was before all those fancy dolls came out that you could have your sex doll and then and then you wouldn't have to kill people. But, you know, he wanted the real thing. He wanted his sex doll, but he wanted it, you know, compliant. So, yes, that's, that's true, Benny. It really wasn't, really wasn't his kind of thing. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean, you know, when you're talking about serial killers, they do weird crap sometimes. Sometimes they do just grab somebody for no reason whatsoever or they think they're going to do something and then it doesn't work out. This can happen. The problem is no one has proof. Even though a blue van, let's go back to our cars again. Even though there was a blue van, a blue van was sighted by some witnesses, and a later witness said he thought he saw somebody throw the Adam in there. There's no proof that, that Dahmer actually accessed this vehicle, that Dahmer actually took this child, there's just no evidence of it. Now, there's another person. Now, if, you know, this the one of the problems you have with, with, with um, anybody who's doing severe, really serious investigation. And I, I'm going to say this about these, these two authors because, I'm gonna, let's say it goes this way, the right way I have it before. Okay. Um, I think the hearts are in it. Because sometimes, sometimes I'll say that I think that these, somebody's just out to make a bunch of money. The guy who wrote the thing on the Black Dahlia who says Daddy did Black Dahlia is all garbage, absolute garbage. And it pisses me off because you have no evidence and yet you're presenting everything as evidence and you're making a lot of money off of suckering a bunch of people who don't know better into thinking you're telling the truth. Um, I think both these guys absolutely believe what they believe. I think the problem is sometimes when you over-investigate, when you're pushing and pushing and pushing to match things together, you start creating evidence, or you start thinking this piece of evidence matches this piece of evidence, and you're going to see in a minute exactly how bad this gets. I think he truly believes this. He went and got his witnesses. He, he, all kinds of people came forth. He looked at everything about him. Now, he knows that Jeffrey Dahmer was close to the area. That is true. So, as far as that goes, I think Harris has got a point. Of Between the two of them, he was near the area. And I'm going to talk about that tool was never proven to be near the area and this is very interesting he was proven to be near the area so if i had to pick between the two of them he would come out ahead just simply because he at least was there <laughs> but that is any proof he took the blue van any reason that he would take the blue van twice without permission get it you know and then take the kind of victim that he picked and that he would have gone way up north to drop a head in a canal i don't think there's any evidence for that however there is some dude that came forth in one of the shows that I watched, and I'm not going to give you the name of the show just because I think it's really well done, by the way, <laughs> but I just don't like things that don't have proof. Um, supposedly, some guy, some truck, some guy, delivery guy, saw a guy that looked like Jeffrey Dahmer 
a few days before the head was found, standing at this spot with a white bucket. Again, there's no proof. There's a guy that claims this. We don't know that there's any truth to this, and that's the problem. The guy could be right. The guy could be dead right, but we don't have proof of it. So unless we can put actual, like, connect the dots, we're just saying, okay, maybe that guy. So what you do is you keep investigating until you get enough people that say things, and then it looks more true. And that's what you can do. Okay, so I'm going to say this. At least he was in the area. <laughs> that's all I can say. Now let's go to Otis Tool, who is the number one suspect. Uh, now, uh, and, and, and at a certain point, what we actually had was John Walsh on his, this is breaking news, well look what it says over here, police identify Otis Tool as killer of Adam Walsh in 19, what does that say, what does that say, 81, can't read it, 81, John Walsh to this day says that he believes Otis Tool was the killer of his son. And the question is, why does he believe this? All right, now we get into some more interesting issues. All right, here is the basics on this. So, Otis Tool confessed a lot, <laughs> but Otis Tool confesses to like everything, <laughs> like everything. Like I don't know. Now, now let me let me read you from each of these books. Okay, uh, okay, I'm going to read you first from from the. The, uh, Harris's book, and he says this, which is true. All right. This is what he says that Otis Tool had confessed. The police chief claimed that he knew things that only the Slayer could have known. This is said often over and over again. He knew things only the, ki the killer and the police knew. I, I pointed that out in quite a few cases that I've already analyzed. And that's great. If, if he really does know any, all, things only the killer would know and nobody else ever knew except the police, well, then that is pretty good. But there's reasons for this. Everything he told them had checked out, said an interviewing detective from Jacksonville. Now, here's what Harris says. Actually, Toole was a serial false confessor, and that is true, who Hollywood and Jacksonville detectives needed to guide with the facts during repeated grillings over periods of days. On his own, he got the simplest of facts ridiculously wrong. Beginning with a statement that the child was wearing mittens. Child was wearing mittens. <laughs> it's Florida, man. Uh, in South Florida. Explained only by his thinking that the kidnapping took place in January, not July. After luring the child into the car on the premise of candy and toys inside. Now, now I find this interesting because... The concept of the, the, the blue van thing where the guy saw the, uh, somebody grab the child and chuck him in the van, I'm more with that. Because I believe that if Adam was standing outside the store, knowing his mother was inside the store, he's not going to get into some guy's car because he said he's got some candy in there. I just find that a little hard to believe. I think it's more likely that somebody just grabbed him. Um, so this is, this is the story that Tool tells is that he lured him. And after he got inside the car, he hit the power door lock button to ensure that the child couldn't easily escape. Except that his car was discovered not to have power buttons. <laughs> so that's bull. He's making up a lie. He also initially blamed the murder on his drifter partner. That was Lucas. Uh, Henry Lee Lucas. Until the partner was proved to be in jail on another st in another state that day. So he said the two of them did the crime. And Lucas was actually the one who killed the child and, and had sex with it and all this stuff. And it turned out that Lucas was actually already in prison. So, he said, and then, then, uh, then Otis Tool said, oh, well, I was just trying to get him in trouble because I was pissed off at him. <laughs> so, so he's lying and he's lying and he's lying. As shown in the transcripts released 13 years later, when it became clear that Tool needed help, detectives dropped him obvious hints showed him photos of the case and gave him heavily weighted multiple choices, which he still didn't always answer correctly. Step by step, they unfolded the entire case. Okay, so this is a problem. And I can't say absolutely who's telling the truth here, but I've seen it happen. You can give multiple choice questions. Did you go here or here? Okay, I went here. You did? No, I went here. That's right, you did. <laughs> Sometimes they will show pictures of the crime scenes. Um, and 
show a picture of this and actually say where it was, the highway marker and all this. They'll show things enough that then later when they, they took Tool, eventually after Tool said he did it, they took him on this road trip, which got him lots of tasty food and stuff like that, and a fun time out of prison. Uh, and they said, okay, was this the Sears? Was that the Sears? But, you know, Tool by this time had already heard the story from the media, and he'd already heard the story from the police. And I, there are some points, I think, that are clearly made that Hoffman, who was doing some of the original stuff, and some other guy that was also involved, had possibly shown him quite a few photos of the case, because you're trying to jog them and make them confess. Well, Tool liked to confess, so yeah, I'll, I'll work with that. So anyway, so at a certain point, they took him on these trips. They said, oh, see, he identified the Sears which was really questionable that he, it wasn't easy to do. But then they came to this point where they said, okay, we took him on this road trip, and we went up here, 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 up here. Oh, my God, he knew where, the, where this marker was. He said this is where he killed the kid, and then a little bit north of that, he dumped the head here. Oh, my God, he obviously is the guy who did it. He knew things that nobody would know but the killer and the police. Although, if they showed him enough photos and talked to him enough, he actually did know exactly what marker it might have been. Now, here was something interesting was pointed out. I think it was Harris that pointed out, and I like it. Now, one of the things that's so weird about this whole thing is that, okay, so, so, Tool look, was up here in Jacksonville, proven to be there, like, at a certain point. And then these five days go by. And during the five days, he supposedly comes down here. He claims he's gotten in his vehicle. He's bought, oh, by the way, he borrowed the vehicle. Here's another thing. So here, so apparently he doesn't own the vehicle either. He borrowed it. He had some access to the gate that this, this place he worked at, and he had, then could get a hold of the car keys, and then he could get some gas. So he took this thing, he got the car, and during a five-day trip, he goes from here, he says he's going to go to Miami, but for some reason, he gets down here to Hollywood, and for no reason whatsoever, jumps off the highway, and ends up kidding, kidnapping this kid from Sears. Okay, after he kidnaps the kid, he doesn't continue down to Holly, uh, down to Miami for some freaky reason. He decides he's going to turn around completely and drive all the way back to Jacksonville, hours and hours away. So, why would he do that? Why wouldn't he just keep going? Why would he suddenly turn around? You know, that, that makes not a lot of sense. But here it gets even weirder. Okay, so how do you get there? So you go up here, and do you see the split here? This is the Hollywood Freeway, and this is... This is 95 going north straight to Jacksonville. If he's going to Jacksonville, he should be going this way. But suddenly, for no reason at all, he takes, he cuts off on a freeway. He's got to pay, it's a tollway too, so he's got to pay tolls. Going toward Orlando. What the hell is he doing going toward Orlando? Why would he get off of there and go all the way over here and then dump a head over here? What? You know, so the story is kind of stupid. Doesn't make any sense. And here's the thing. There's never any proof any proof that Tool ever left Jacksonville to come down to Hollywood and go back. There's no proof at all. There's no evidence that he ever left Jacksonville because he's just claiming, he was there, he's claiming during those five days he, he took this car, which we don't know he even took because nobody ever said he took it, and then he went down there and did this, and we have no proof he was ever even on that route. So, yeah, okay, I understand. Did you think he, whoops, that's upside down. That Tool's, Tool's a creepy guy, and he confessed over and over, and then he recanted over and over, and then he confessed, and they recanted, and then he confessed, and they recanted. I could go on for 10 minutes on that. I get it that he's a creepy dude, and, and Tool will confess to anything, and he also will do anything. So one of the reasons they thought he could be the guy was because he does weird stuff. Like, in, he doesn't kill for ne necessarily good reasons. So, yeah, he could have thought, this will be fun. And he, they got the kid, and then the kid pissed him off. Supposedly, the kid's sitting next to him in the car, and, and, and it pissed him off enough as they were driving north. He started whining, and so he smashed him in the face. And they say that matches the, the head that was found that had some damage to the face, which, quite frankly, there's really no proof of. And then, supposedly, he says he strangled him with a seatbelt. Then later he says he strangled him with his hands. You know, they say the story goes on and on. And then at some point he uh, kills him supposedly and and uh, chops up his, his, bo his body parts are somewhere. They never found his body. And then he cut the head off, he says, with a, bar uh, um, a bayonet, I don't know what you say, bayonet, um, some, some knifey thing. And 
then 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 Hoffman says, "You mean you mean a machete?" And he goes, "Yeah, yeah, machete." <laughs> He changed that story. So then they come up eventually with a machete that belonged to somebody that, you know, like the car dude that owned the car. Also, there was a machete up that way. And they start doing, they start doing luminol testings. And, and so here was her comes where, oh, look, there's luminol on this, there's blood on this uh, machete that we don't even know that, that was even used in the crime, that we don't even know that tool even accessed. So it gets to be nonsensical. So now, Let's take a look at the real big information, okay? Okay, here it comes. Are you ready? All right. Now, they, see, oh, see the, oh, wait a minute, let me put my car back up here. Let's see the car. Okay, car here. This is the car he supposedly accessed, which they have no proof he accessed, <laughs> at least not at that point in time. They did luminal testing on this car, and oh my God, this was the eureka moment. And if you read this book, Joe Matthews, at the end, he keeps referring to it. Oh, my God, it's coming, it's coming. And then at the moment, at the end, here's the absolute proof. And he showed it to John Walsh, and he, John Walsh just fell apart because, oh, my God, here's the proof that tool killed my son. Now, why do you see this? All right, what did he show, what happened with Illuminol? Okay, uh, what happened with Illuminol? Here we go, ready? All right, the Illuminol, here's the first thing. In the car. Uh, here we have a, the floorboards of Otis Tool's Cadillac, all right, or the Cadillac he borrowed, mind you. And and so you see below on the top you see the, the the floor mat, and then on the below you see that little bit of uh, luminol lighting up, and that is claimed to be his footprints. And okay, maybe it is, maybe it's not. I don't know. I can't really tell if it's footprints, but okay. Let me let me go with that. Let's say for some reason the. Now, mind you, luminol shows up with blood, but it also shows up with other substances as well, so it's not total proof of anything. But anyway, okay, well, let's say those are footprints. <clears throat> okay, but here's the thing. Behind the back seat, behind the driver's seat, on the floor, was this, this whole area lit up. Oh, my God, this was it. This was where the head of Adam Walsh was put. And this is absolute 100% proof. Now, this, now, mind you, this is they, they, just, they, they had he had to move the the luminol. It wasn't like this. He had to flip it around. But anyway, that doesn't matter because we don't know what way the head landed. But here is the picture of the luminol. See, that's a luminol that was on uh, uh, on the floor behind the driver's seat. And as you can see, uh, he has made a picture, a little diagram at the bottom of the face of. The, uh, tr this face ahead. Now, if you look carefully, you can see the two black spots uh, in the middle are his eyes, and then there's a black spot that's totally in the middle. That's the nose, and then there's a big black spot. That's the mouth. Can you all see that? Can you clearly see that? That is the face of Adam Walsh. That's his head lying in the back of the vehicle. And Joe Matthews will claim 100%, my God, that proves that. See, you can see his face right there. My God, you can see his face. And Adam Walsh, I mean, John Walsh said, oh, my God, that's my son's face. And that closed the case. Now, I want to point out something about this particular photo, okay? Now, first of all, one of the things Tool says is that he, when, after he cut Adam Walsh's head off, he took his shirt and wrapped it around his head. Okay? And then chucked it in the car. Now, when the, when the head lies in the back and, and blood is pooling all over the shirt and all that stuff, I doubt you're going to see two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. I doubt you're going to see that. You're going to see blood on the floor, but it's not necessarily going to be two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Okay? That is unlikely. All right, so let me show you some more. I looked at this photo, and I just want you to understand I wanted to give this photo a chance. So I looked at this photo, this luminol photo, and I came up with a few other things. Okay, here's a luminol photo. I think it could have been a fat bullfrog. Now look at that. You see the head to the left? You see the big fat tummy? You see the arms of the bullfrog you know, out on the top and the bottom, and the leg even extends from the, the bottom right? That's a bullfrog. Now, you know, bullfrogs are food. Uh, who knows? You know, he, he knows. Uh, 
tool, doesn't have a lot of money sometimes, and he found a bullfrog, went out bullfrog killing, because people do, and they eat frogs, and so he could have brought that bullfrog home. Could have killed that bullfrog and, and put it in the back of the, dumped it in the back of the vehicle. You got a bullfrog. All right. Not a bullfrog, you think? Okay. Maybe it's a fish. Now, fishing, this is, this is a popular fish down there. It's tilapia. It is a, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to point out Florida wildlife. That was a Florida bullfrog. This is a Florida tilapia. Now, look at that. You see the fin? You see the mouth open on the left? You see the fin hanging at the bottom? And at the top, you don't, you can see sort of the start of that row of, whatever you call those things on the top, the fins in a row. I don't know what you call those kind of things. But see, it could well be, it could well be a tilapia fish that he, hey, that's even very possible. They went fishing and threw a fish in the bottom and there would, there would be blood there too. All right. Maybe he's a little bit bigger of a hunter. Now, there's also wild boar in Florida. And if you look at this picture, can you see the ear at the top? That's the ear of the, the boar. And then you can see see the second ear that's going off to the left. You can see the eye in the middle. See that little dot right in the center? That's his eye. And you see the snout over to the right. It matches the snout on the picture. It's a boar head. I think it's a boar head. Okay. I want your comments on that. What do you think? Do you think it's Adam Walsh's head? Do you, do you think it's a fish? Do you think it's a frog? Do you think it's a boar? What do you think? I, I, want, I want your comments on that. You look. You saw the picture. What do you, what do you think it is? <laughs> do you think it's clearly Adam's face? Or do you think it's one of the other possibilities? It's a Rorschach test. This is the problem with it. It's a Rorschach test. You know, just because you've got a, something lighting up doesn't necessarily mean too well. Yes, this is exactly correct. I think people see what they want to see, especially when you want to see that. It could be anything. It could be. It didn't take me long to find those other three pictures, too. And, and those looked pretty darn good. I mean, I think each one of those could have been represented by that luminal. <laughs> Lisa says, I vote for the froggy. <laughs> I mean, you know, it could be the froggy. I mean, there's more likelihood that he went fishing or, you know, because you know, he's looking for food and he threw that in the back than, than it was uh, Adam's head. It could be many things. Yeah, I'd say it's a total Rorschach, Rorschach test. Uh, and it, and it's, it's, what's frustrating is that in this book, uh, they can't, they, there's no way to tell. There's absolutely no way. To, there, was no, there was no way to test. There was no way to test it was even blood. They don't even know if it's blood. It could be bleach. It could be other things in there. It, there are other things that react. There's no way. And they have no idea. When, it ha when, the, when that was put in the car, remember this car has been out there for, for ages. It could be anybody else who used the car who went fishing or did anything else. So this is a lot of nonsense, but they put this in there as the absolute proof that Adam's head was in the back and that proved that Tool committed the crime. Now, I did promise you an Easter surprise. Are you ready for it? The Easter surprise is here. So I, I did look at that very carefully that test and I know it's not I do know it's not Adam's head I know it's not a frog I know it's not a fish I know it's not a boar because I absolutely know that this is clearly Jesus Christ because look there's his eye you see the nose right here you see the nose there's his nose there's his eye right there and look at the the beard down here you see the beard right here there's the beard that that is clearly, oh look, let me go over here a second. See, it's Jesus Christ. He has risen again in the back of Otis Tool's car. <laughs> but, is this not as clearly Jesus Christ as it is Adam Walsh? Look at that. I mean, that's a pretty darn good likeness of Jesus Christ. It's a shroud of Turin, exactly. <laughs> it's, no, no. It's, I think it's called the Shroud of Otis, Otis Tool, which is really creepy. The Shroud of Otis Tool. Maybe he killed, he's the one that killed Jesus Christ. But look at that. See? You, you, want, you want to see something that looks like Jesus Christ? There it is, you know? Oh, my God, you know? This, I, 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 
<laughs> Bring your one pat. Yeah, this is. I just want to show you this because <laughs> it's Elvis. I don't think so. I think it's Jesus. You know. Oh my God. <laughs> this is. This is. But this is the problem. This is how bad it is. I mean, you can you can see Mother Mary's face in a cracker. You know what I mean? I've seen people. It's all over the internet. You can you can see it. Her face is in a cracker. Her face is in a soup bowl. Her face is on. You know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's Lord Lucan. <laughs> it, it could be. <laughs> it's a Pat and Joe show. <laughs> I mean, but, the, but this, I, I, I just, when I had to find, I, when I found this, I'm like, I just got to point this out because this is how bad it is. Now, let me read you. I want to read you from the book. I want to read you exactly what it was said here. All right. This is the Matthews report, and, I, and Joe Matthews, I, I honestly believe you believe this stuff, but I, th I think when you went, you were pretty, you had some good information here that you could say, yes, Tool could have done it. When you got to the point where you were starting to say that this was the face of Adam, Adam Walsh, you kind of lost me, and that made me really, as a red flag to me that you were, you were unwilling to, you, you'd lost your ability to be objective. Um, so in here, it says here, and most damning image of them all which has both haunted and sustained Matthew since the moment it wavered into focus on his office desk, desk months before, as powerful to him as the Shroud of Turin. Shroud of Turin. Traced in the blue glow of Luminol was the outline of a familiar young boy's face. A negative pressed into the floorboard carpeting, eye sockets blackened, blank cavities, mouth twisted in an oval of pain. Wow. Wow. That's subjective creativity. Unbelievable. Now it goes on. What Joel Matthew had produced, the terrible image, what he had to show to John and Reve, and which everyone in the room around him now viewed as well was no less powerful in its effect. The glowing blue image pressed into the carpet, the outline of Adam's face etched in his own blood, was as stark as any fragment of bone. No, a fragment of bone is a fragment of bone. This is nothing. And the cry that issued from his battered lips was as damning an indictment as anyone might ever hear. If, if you can indict a person based on a Rorschach interpretation on a carpet. You have lost your total objectivity and you are no longer acting as a true detective. Oh Lord. Oh. Yeah, so eventually it says here, um, where is the words when he finally shows it goes on because they're 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 giving they're giving waiting to give to show this to uh, John Okay, and then eventually, where's where's the part where he shows it to John? Uh, I thought I, I thought I hit. Okay, uh, where'd it go? Um. So this is a smoking gun. The smoking gun. Yeah. Um, so he, get, he shows this to John, and um, it, John Walsh adds that while the family would never recover from Adam's death, they could finally move on. Still, he noted it's not about closure. It's about justice, which, you know, O'Toole is dead now, so that's not going to be that. But, yeah, um, I have a problem with that. So, the case has been closed, administratively closed, by the Hollywood Police Department and John Walsh and, and Joe Matthews, who all say, undeniably, the face in the, in the, in, in the, on the carpet was not Jesus Christ, but Adam Walsh. All right, so I'm just going to go to some of your comments now. It's just uh, <laughs> unbelievable. 
Oh, that's true. Could be Charles Manson. Oh, that's that's actually true, Annie. That's a kind of good Charles Charles Manson too. But it's Easter. I want I want to go with Jesus. Um, <laughs> I knew he'd be back. <laughs> Uh, it's about time too, yeah. But he, he ended up in O'Toole's tool, car. It's just horrifying. Um, let's see. Um, Carrie says, "I think the Walshes really wanted, needed to know who murdered their son. That that this affected their judgment. So John Walsh saw what he wanted to see. I absolutely agree with that. I think they've had they had so many years. They were exhausted. They they." they they were exhausted trying to figure out who killed their son. Um, they knew about they knew about Dahmer, and they knew about Tool, and they went with what they considered was the more likely suspect in their mind. Um, and 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 I guess this this supposed picture. Let me let me go back and put the picture up of that they saw, which I didn't see at all, and I think is absolutely not. Oh, oh sorry, I don't have it there. Um, not even close. Um, Oh, sorry, that's over here. Uh, it's not, in my opinion, uh, it's more Jesus Christ than it would ever be, Adam. But you know, but you can see it. If you st keep staring at it, you will see it's a face of a little boy. You can see it if you keep staring at it and believe it and believe it. And what's interesting is you see that hole for the nose? Well, that's only assuming his nose isn't there. That's like a, see, the point is he threw his, the head into the water the nose was still there, so there's no reason why there would be a hole where the nose was. You see the problem here? So, unless you cut the nose off, the nose should not be, that should not be a hole. So, there, it, 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 it doesn't match in any way, shape, or form. But, yes, they're, they're believing it because they want to believe it. And so, so, so here's the question. Let me, let me get back to what the basic question was. Who killed, who killed Adam Walsh? Who then killed Adam Walsh? This guy or this guy? I'm going to say, this guy at least was in the area. Both of these had an access to a vehicle that could have they could have used, but there's no proof that either one of them used it. There was no proof, absolute proof, either one of them, either one of them was there at that shopping center that day or had reason to be there. Um, there was no proof he was even he was even down the Hollywood way. There was no proof. Um, there's no physical proof in spite of that that. Uh, fake stuff in the, on the carpet there, um, there's no actually no proof that either one of them killed Adam Walsh. So, who killed Adam Walsh? Well, there are other serial killers out there. It could have been any other serial killer. Some guy who did haunt the mall, who did do surveillance in the mall, saw Adam and just simply grabbed him, took him to his home, did what he wanted with him, Eventually killed him, and maybe he had relatives up north, and he went up north and then dumped his, dumped his, dumped his uh, maybe the body is still buried in the backyard. Maybe he had the head in the car because he thought it was fun, and then he got cl got up north, and he thought, oh, well, hell, that I'll dump the, dump, the, dump the head. Could have been anybody. It could have been any other serial killer. It could be. And there's just no proof that either one of these guys did it. So, in my opinion, this is an open case an unsolved case with no solid evidence to prove any particular person did it. And I know that's not what the Walshes would want to hear. Or any, either, either, either these two guys who, you know, 100% believe they got the right person. But I don't see it. I don't see any solid evidence. I don't know who did it. I have no pun to point to because the evidence does not support either one of these guys in any strong way. It's possible, but I just have no proof. And it could have been any other serial killer. It's like it's, if you look around the country, it's not like some other serial killer couldn't have killed him and dumped his head in a canal. It's not impossible for somebody else to do it. Then we just don't know who it was. Um, so I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. And as a profiler, that's what I should say. As a detective, that's what I should say. That there was not enough evidence to support any particular person being the actual perpetrator of the crime and that's where I stand so um, and he says I never thought it was Otis uh, you know I just don't know I mean it could be but it's just nothing there's nothing that there's no proof there's absolutely no proof um, and that's problem it's and yes it's not his usual mo 
That's correct, Martin. Um, it isn't. That's not his MO. It doesn't mean, again, he couldn't have done that on an off day. Um, I don't put it by serial killers to change their MOs when they're in certain situations that they just do something that is not normal. We all do things that aren't our usual MOs on certain days. Um, because we, we're bored, we, we're desperate, we, we just, hey, the opportunity presented itself. So I can't exclude these guys because I can't prove they couldn't have done it. I just can't prove in any way that they did do it. So um, I think I agree with Carrie. I think the Walshes needed to have this solved in order to move on emotionally. I don't blame them at all. That kind of heartache will kill you. I, I agree. Uh, and, you know, I think that's true. I think they just wanted not to have to think about it anymore because both these guys are dead. So at least you don't have to think about it. If the bad guy is dead, you can just hope he gets justice in the hereafter. And you can just finally just say, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't have to deal with it anymore. Uh, I will say this, that it was a 1970s case. Um, hmm, let's say it's been 30. Wait a minute, 30. I'm sorry, not 1970s, sorry. It's been 80s. It's been 30 years. In theory, the guy could still be out there. He could have been 20, 20 30 years old at the time. He could be 50, 60, 70 years old. The killer of Adam Walsh could still be out there. And I guess the wall, now, I understand it. I say it. The tragedy they went through, the heartache they felt, the emotions they went through. I say, I, I, it's one of the cases that I felt the strongest about when I, when I saw the movie and I and I read read the story of you know how John Walsh felt. I mean, it's it's probably the best example of the pain a victim, uh, a family of a victim goes through, a family of a missing and murdered child. So there was no way to find any DNA. No, there's there's no DNA. There's no DNA in this case whatsoever. Um, the head was found in the, the canal. It was there for a while, uh, and we don't know how the how long the while was. In one of the book and 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 the bringing home book, they claim that there were chemicals put into the stream that kept the the head really nice. But in other places, they say no, the head was munched on by you know animals. Um, it's very hard to get a, a a proper read on that at all. Um, so, the, but the answer is no. There was no DNA anywhere in this case, zero. Uh, uh, Penny says, I think we can 99% exclude Otis from the crime as he did not even know the basic facts. That is, that is very true. Um, he, <laughs> when he kept telling the story about the crime, he, he was off on so many things. He, he said he had the wrong cap on. He said he had the wrong clothes on. He, I, don't think he think, I don't even think he got the description of the kid right. Um, yeah, pretty much everything he described about the boy was basically wrong. <laughs> so, so, I mean... Yeah, it's, it wasn't convincing to me what he said about, yeah, I wasn't convinced. The only thing that made me question whether I, oh, maybe he did do it, was when I first started reading in this book, when they started taking him on the little tour, and he goes, oh, yeah, that's where, that's, that's, that's where I pulled over and I, and I, and I killed him. Then 10, then 10 minutes north or 10, whatever, 10 minutes, yeah, just 10 minutes drive north, that's where I dumped his head in the canal, and, and it matched, and I'm like, okay. If Otis Tool was not fed any information, if he was never shown any photo of anything, didn't know any mile, uh, mile markers on the highway, didn't know anything, then I would say <laughs> that's, that's just too close for comfort to say he didn't do it. But then it comes down to that there was a lot of incoming information that helped him remember. And, and there, there you have the question right there. So this is the problem again. When people write books too, they leave certain information out that doesn't support what they want to put out there. Uh, so if he was shown things that he shouldn't have been shown, um, they don't want to mention that. So, and yet in many investigations, they do feed information because they're hoping that by feeding one piece of information, the person will give them a second piece of information that will then be something they didn't shouldn't know. So let's say you say for example, uh, so you went down Florida Turnpike, right? And that's a piece of information you're feeding. And the guy goes, yeah, that's where I went down. And then you say, and where did you stop? See, now you're hoping you you get encouraged him to get on the on the turnpike. And then he says, oh, I stopped at such and such an area. See, then you say, okay, now I've got more information. 
So sometimes they feed information to get information. But the problem is, sometimes when they're interviewed by a number of different people, they get fed all kinds of different information, and then they use it, <laughs> this guy's information to tell this guy, and then you think, oh my God, he knows things that he shouldn't know. And so a lot of times it's poor investigative methodology. Um, I'm not saying it happened in this case, but it's, it's alluded to that it did happen in this case. So unless he never got any information whatsoever from the police in any way, shape, or form, never saw a crime scene photo, never was told anything about the locations, then I'd say, hey, he, he might have done it. But uh, I was suspicious that he had been, inf information had gotten to him that he was just using. But yes, his, his entire description of the child was so off. It was, just, it was pretty sad. <laughs> exactly said. Yes, this is very true. We cannot blame Adam's parents. In no way do I blame Adam's parents for believing that Tool did it. Uh, you know, they have the right to have their own own beliefs. Where I'm concerned about is that the police department closed the case based on questionable information. Because this is important to me as far as investigative methods go. Because now when you say, oh, absolutely, he did it, then all the future investigators will look at this case and say he did it. You see, because you're feeding them a story that is not necessarily supported by information. That's evidence. And that bothers me because I want good police investigation. I want good future police investigation. And I don't think you should ever close a case down unless you're absolutely sure. And I don't know that, I don't know how they can be absolutely sure on this one. And I, 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 fault, I fault them for doing that. John Walsh is, a, is a, a, a family of a victim and he's not a police detective and he was not with the department. He may support the department's decision to say he did it, but I don't support the department's decision to say he did it. So, <laughs> this is what I always thought too. He wasn't really involved, but he hit it lucky, like a broken clock. Yeah, you know, if you say enough stuff, and, and I want to point out, this is very good, Kay, what you said. You know, oftentimes when you're investigating, you want to hear something, you only hear what ring, what hits. You don't hear all the, you don't hear the misses. Because you think the misses are mi things that are misleading you. And then when they hit something, you're like, aha, see? <laughs> That's it. He did it. <laughs> and like you said, all he has to do is keep fudging things and then pushing it this way and then pushing it that way. Oh, I think it's this exit. Well, you know, you sure it's this exit? Maybe, maybe it was the next exit. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, see? It's the next exit. He knew. Did he? Hmm. Um, you taught me about how law enforcement likes to solve cases. You know, um, and, you know, the problem there is that they, there's a massive amount of pressure to solve cases, massive amount of pressure from the media, from the family, from everybody to solve the case. And if you can finally solve the case, you get lots of kudos and lots of peace all the way around. You know, so, I mean... And then you'd like to, and, and then of course you just like to solve the case. You know, you want to know that you solved the case. You want to believe you solved the case. You know, you want to know that, hey, we, we, we finally found the killer of Adam Walsh. We, don't, we can put this to bed. Isn't that great? Everybody's relieved. And sometimes, sometimes it's done in a way that you, they absolutely know it's not necessarily true, but they're willing to do it anyway. And then there's sometimes where their hearts are into it and they just, they, they convince themselves to believe that they've solved the case, and, and then they're happy about that. So, Lisa says, I've had difficulty finding a good documentary about this case. Why do you think, Pat? Hmm. I honestly don't know. Uh, the movie is great, um, but the documentary, uh, I don't, again, I'm not big on documentaries because I always find them very uh, media-driven and not evidence-driven. So, I, I do watch some of the documentaries to comment on them, uh, and sometimes to gain information, but I'm always a little, you know, I always have questions about these things. But this is why you have to, you know, unfortunately do a lot of research. Um, like you say, I've got this book and I've got this book. I read both of them and, you know, so I spent time with these books. Um, and I looked up other information. But the problem a lot of times that will happen is people will read one book or they'll read the other book. And then they will then seek out information that only supports this side or this side. And then you get these, these you know, 
these channels, these YouTube channels to say this, we're trying to prove, you know, we know this is what happened or we know this is what happened. And then you get a lot of distorted information because they all have some kind of, you know, they're part, it's part of the game that they're playing that, I mean, and, and I don't necessarily mean in a bad way, it's just like, oh yeah, see, I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to prove that this guy did it. So, hey, we're all going to jump on board. We're going to look for every piece of evidence and then we're going to get all the armchair profilers together and we're going to find even more evidence and we're going to find every little thing we can think of that's going to say, this guy did it. And then there's a whole group that say, now we're going to find every piece of evidence that this guy did it. But in reality, they're not actually coming up with evidence. That's the problem. It's not true evidence. And it's just a bunch of conjecture and a bunch of wishful thinking and a bunch of, you know, yeah. Um, Lisa Carrie says, I think the absence of evidence accounts for this on the Walsh case. Um, hmm. Well, that's a good question. Maybe nobody wants to touch it. You know, it may be that, again, you, you, you know, you talk about the heart of the Walshes, that they're finally put this to bed they can just say this guy did it and we just don't want to think about it anymore and maybe it's hard to go out there and stir all this stuff up again and 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 do that to the washes so maybe that's why it it's not worth doing um it may be because it may be this because they've determined he did it already it's closed on this guy that the media doesn't want to make a whole documentary on something that's already known a known fact right because that's not exciting they would have to go with Dahmer they'd have to make the the the, the media this is the usual what they do with documentaries let's go with that maybe maybe it's actually this guy but doing that makes them look bad because the Walshes have already agreed that's this guy they if they go do a whole documentary on Dahmer they're just gonna look like bums because they're just gonna like they're stabbing the Walshes in the heart so how, how, Netflix, how could you do a thing on saying Dahmer did it? So while, while they're usually willing to do that, I think in this case, they, I think because of the Walsh's, they're, they're, they're not, that's going to make them look so bad, I don't think they're willing to do that. So that's what I think. Um, yeah, Benny says, yeah, many documentaries about true crime are a bit similar to conspiracy theories. They are, and you know, and it's not that sometimes there's not a question. Uh, the problem is how it's presented. Um, are you presenting it as looking at this as an interesting thing and here's evidence and, and true information or are you just mucking up a whole bunch of stuff to, to make money? <laughs> there's, a, there's a difference between the two things and I, I point that out often um, because I'm not against people coming up with a, you know, an alternate theory on things. Um, I've done it. you know. Um, it's just I, I object to the methodology and how it's presented as you know, basically a moneymaker. And, and, and not caring about the truth and not caring about the evidence and not being honest. That, 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 that truly offends me. So there you go. That's the way I think on that. So anyway, um, that is basically it, what I have to say on this case. I think it's fascinating and very sad. Um, and, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I said, I'm, tr I'm again, truly amazed at the, the Rorschach test. I, I, I think that, that was the thing that just blew me away when, when I saw that originally, I, I, I remember being <laughs> totally, totally like, you got to be kidding. I mean, and I, I was just stunned. I was absolutely stunned. I'm like, you know, it, you know, that you closed a case down, a case down based on a complete false premise that, that, this picture, this uh, this luminol on the on the floor, and this, by the way, is enhanced. The luminol actually looks even worse than this. It looks even more garbagey. This is an actually enhanced enhanced picture of the luminol, and that you decided it had to be the the face of Adam Walsh when it clearly makes no sense, especially since his nose is missing, uh, you know, and his nose wouldn't have been missing, and none of none of it makes any sense, and just lost all objectivity, and I find that sad, um, and it kind of makes then you question the rest of everything. So, you know, I know Joe Matthews' heart's in it, but now, Joe, I question how much of the rest of the stuff I can't believe because if you're willing to say that this is clearly the, the face of Adam Walsh and not Jesus Christ, I don't know what to say, you know? I don't. Um, and I think it's unfortunate, uh, but, but interesting, <laughs> really interesting. So anyway, that is the uh, f final thing I'm going to say on the, in this particular case. I think it's um, 
I think it's an open case. That's my opinion. It's not open by the police department, but I believe it is an unsolved case. Now, there's no, there's no, nothing to prove anybody particularly committed the crime of uh, killing, abducting and killing Adam Walsh, and it should remain an open case. But, you know, that's that's my take on it. So anyway, thank you for being here. Um, again, if you if you're here for the first time, please do like and subscribe to the channel. Give us some support, and if you'd like to participate in the wonderful discussions we have live, please do click on the link below on Patreon and join and support the channel. I would appreciate that a whole lot, I tell you. Okay, so thank you, everybody, and I will see you next time.